living in a state of hope. It wouldn't be clear to people why I should be in a state of hope after Peter describes how difficult things are. Uh, what's interesting is we're beginning to see the discussion around an extension of the public pension system in Ontario. Uh, who would have thought that possible? We're hearing talk about Pharmacare. That's a big program. And it hasn't been laughed out yet. Why? Because there is a crisis as we age and there's a crisis in terms of the cost of drugs. The crisis of the moral order that we have is that we have accepted the reasons for not acting and the reasons, the reasons that we've been given for not acting are losing their credibility. The credibility has been lost. In my lifetime, I think of all the things we were told and that have not worked out. We're told that progress in addressing poverty requires policy that encourage economic growth. We were told that's the key thing. We've had economic growth, and we still have a persistence of poverty. It hasn't ended our poverty. We're told that getting a job is the best road out of poverty. People get jobs, and too many people work full year, full time, and still have to raise their kids and their families in poverty. We're told that more education is a pathway out of poverty. We have created the best educated generation of people living in poverty and on social assistance. You'd be surprised the number of people in poverty on social assistance who have some level of post-secondary education. And we were told the biggest distortion of all, the biggest distortion of all, lower taxes will create a more robust economy in which we can look after people. And we've had lower taxes and we have no evidence of a more robust economy. I think the uh, demand or the, the, the likelihood that we will extend the public pension system, that we'll get pharmacare, is the sign that we are on the verge of turning the corner to act collectively. The notion that any real change is going to happen from the community. Uh, it might have been at one time that we could hope for certain types of initiatives at the national level. We've been caught up in uh, notions of austerity and uh, primarily financial efficiencies uh, over the last 20 years or more, since uh, the early 90s. Uh, and so much uh, change really has to depend on coming from the ground up. Groups like your own, many of you I think are here probably associated with, involved with nonprofit organizations where good imaginative ideas come out of Frequently those ideas, when they first uh, led to certain types of programs in the 50s and 60s, would be picked up by government and actually uh, implemented, like better child care programs, employment, employment programs, housing. So we, we do believe that uh, Marvin and I and the Social Planning Network, that our theory of change is that community, change will really happen out of the community. But more than that, it will happen by communities working with other communities. Our strategy is a cross-community strategy. That is that you can actually effect change if you build communities sharing common values and principles and goals and strategies and working together at the local level with respect to their own policy makers but also then having that influence at the provincial and the federal levels by working what we call cross-community strategies. And actually when Trudy uh, talks about uh, the blueprint for poverty reduction that Marvin and I well, we didn't really write it. We actually went out twice over the course of a year in 2008. Uh, two communities, 30 communities over the course of that year meeting. We were in Kitchener, Waterloo several times. Uh, and we brought forward to people some possible ideas to think about for what a poverty reduction strategy might include. And we got feedback from the community. And before we were finished that presentation, we had 17 versions. 17 modifications to the so-called blueprint that we brought out. 
that we essentially were the messengers. Are we were the consolidators that we presented? Of uh, course, it wasn't the government didn't just use our blueprint, but this was the community's position on what the poverty reduction strategy should be. And some of the things that they did include in their own strategy did reflect what the community had generated the blueprint. was not made up of traditional organizations, but coalitions of communities from across the country that actually led to things like the National Child Benefit that did actually have an impact on child poverty at the national level if we did not eliminate poverty, child poverty, even as we had hoped. Similarity of poverty reduction more recently around campaigns like Put Food in the Budget. You might think that Put Food in the Budget, trying to get a more adequate incomes in people's hands and social assistance, $100 a month to start, hasn't been won. But if in fact, if there hadn't been this cross-community action over the last two or three years, put food in the budget, led in many cases by people who are on social assistance, on OW, ODSP, we wouldn't have had the $26 a month increase of the last budget. Because the put food in the budget position, amazingly enough, was endorsed by 25 municipal councils and public health departments. And this, in Ontario, city councils are frequently relatively conservative. But 25 city councils support the, that position, which is why uh, the Lankin report, Lankin uh, report actually referred to that particular action as a reason for her to recommend that $100 a month be added to people as social. So the official commission's position was what the community wanted, and she referred specifically to the reason because of the broad. That's an example of cross-community action. We have to understand it in terms of what we need basically to live with any kind of decency. What do we need? We need enough. We need enough income to buy the basic necessities of life to have some reasonable way to participate in the community. Have enough food. We need stable homes. We need not just housing, but stable homes. Homes we can afford, homes that are comfortable, that are safe, that allow us to raise our children, your seniors, to allow you to still have a base on which to participate in the community. Uh, we need things to do. We need to work. We need to make a contribution in some way. Have some kind of meaningful activity. And just look what's happened with these three basic needs that all of us have, not just poor people. All of us have three basic needs. Look what's happened since the 1980s. First recession, early 1980s. First food banks, mid-1980s. Starting in Edmonton, soon moving to Toronto. What happened in the 1990s? 1990s, we lost a lot of our affordable housing programs, both federally and provincially. What did we see in the 1990s? The growth of homelessness. People being on the streets. People using, having to use shelters more often people being in overcrowded housing. And now what do we see in the 2000s? We see in the 2000s a crisis in employment, the loss of good stable jobs, a loss of good union representation for people to have protections and benefits, the increase of precarious work. So when I think of the chances to create change again, I know many people have similar stories about how they got involved in the work and how they got involved in the field, whether it's municipal service or nonprofit service. And this is the passion out of which we have to create different ways of thinking and doing things with respect to creating distant lies. And we have to do it in communities like this. But we have to find these stories and join our stories with communities in Cambridge and St. Catharines and Sudbury and North Bay, like we have in all these other examples I gave you, in order to make some impression on the people who make the decisions that things can be different, that we can create decent, decent lives, and especially that the next generation has to have an opportunity to make sure that, uh, that nobody is left out, that everybody contributes, and we all have decent lives. So, thanks very much. We have wealth. Make no bones about it. We're not lacking wealth. Let me give you a clear idea. The tax cuts that we've witnessed for the last 30 years have led to a phenomenon that the International Monetary Fund calls dead money. What is dead money? The money has been retained by corporations, not invested in sustaining employment, has led to unbelievable differentials in income because some of the tax cuts went to creating absurd wage incomes and some of them have gone to creating the excuses. The International Monetary Fund talks about the fact that in Canada, we have about 50, no, we have, let me tell you what, we have about $80 billion worth of dead income. Each year, each year, around $80 billion that would go into public purposes, that would serve as public revenue to do the things we want to, has been taken out, has been withdrawn. 
the ability of governments to act collectively. And when governments act collectively, we benefit. The market sector has never demonstrated the ability to act collectively and to look after everyone. So Peter and I have been talking about the need to talk about, the need to pursue the question of decent work and decent income. And the word decency is becoming much more prevalent in the vocabulary. Much more prevalent. And decency is a statement of moral, as a statement of moral balance. What is decent? What is morally appropriate? The people shouldn't work full year, full, full time, and still have to raise, to live in poverty and raise their children in poverty. That's been the moral contention. It's been very effective, by the way. It's been very effective. We're getting movement, which we never suspected, okay, five years ago. We get so hung up on data. We need data to demonstrate what is clear to everybody. What are we going to do? Add up that there are not enough calories for healthy life in the budgets we have for food? We know there aren't. And so we've not had major cuts in social assistance in the last three or four years. Because the case, we haven't had welfare bashing as we used to have. Because the notion that people living on social assistance incomes are living on precipices where the money runs out. If the money runs out, so I am hopeful that we can, we have to look at what are the moral contentions. What kind of moral order do we want to tell people about? Healthcare is the best example of where a moral contention is carried. What is the greatest argument in Canada for, for, uh, for Medicare? A one-tier system, the argument for a one-tier system is the inability to pay for health care should not determine access to essential care. It's simple. We don't need reams of data. Decency, common people understand that. And there is a real decency court in Canada. And it's being tested. Now we're not gonna, we're not gonna enter into a utopia. What we're gonna see is a building up, building up of a new common sense. A new common sense. And when it takes off, Okay, it'll be possible for us to see things done.